for our grade as they've received it in the first step of the process where we're assessing quality control. You can see the probe apparatus, the gentleman that's in our scale house in our office is operating this, uh, this piece of equipment and he probes it down into the, one of the hoppers on the truck. And it's going to have a vacuum that pulls out part of the grain that's going to convey it over to the office. And in the office, he's going to have a couple of machines that are going to sample for moisture, for foreign material, for any type of broken corn. They're going to sample for different toxins such as aflatoxin. But on any given day, we might have anywhere from 50 to 100, up to 150 trucks that will be bringing grain in. Behind us here is what we call our process building, our process area, and the main component is going to be our fermenters and our beer wells. So NME has four fermenters, each 750,000 gallons of capacity, and then the beer well, which is approximately 1 million gallons of capacity. So if I'm a kernel of corn and I start off in the front end of our process, one of the uh, most prominent questions that I'm asked is how long does it take for that kernel of corn to pass through our facility? And that's going to be approximately two to three days. And the majority of that time is going to be in our fermentation vessel. We take about 48 to 60 hours to ferment our grain into ethanol. And from this location, it's pumped over to the right to our distillation towers. Those are the tall vertical vessels in the background. And we have three of them here at our facility. And that's where, by difference in boiling point, that we're going to separate our alcohol from the non fermentable. So in essence, we inject beer at the top of those distillation towers. The ethanol vapors are going to blow out the top and be recondensed into our final product. The remaining water and unfermentable corn solids and protein, the fat and the fiber, is going to fall at the bottom of those columns. And then from that point, they're going to run through a process and ultimately go to our dryer to become our EDTS. So our CO2 scrubber, the emissions point where CO2 is coming off the fermentation vessel, is in the background on this tower. It's kind of hard to see, but it's a vertical vessel. And on the top of that is a T-valve. But in essence, we can divert that valve to vent CO2 out to the atmosphere as we traditionally would do. But when our CO2 plant, CO2 plant is operating, we can close that valve down and pour CO2 into the lower setup. And from there, the CO2 gas is pressurized and flowing over to the CO2 facility. Tank here in the background. This is our slurry tank. This is kind of where it all starts in our process. Overhead, the corn flyer is going to come in and get mixed in with hot reclaimed liquid and make what we call the yellow mash. And this is the first part of our process really where we start to break down the starch before we pump it into our fermentation vessel. We're at NME's secondary control room, and I'm just going to take a moment and show you our distributed control system, our DCS, as we call it. This is the computer interface that our employees work with and operate. So our plant is highly automated. You can see just for example on this top screen, this is a screenshot of our different fermentation tanks. And you can monitor the level, the temperature, the length of time that is on each fermenter. You can see our heat exchangers and the temperatures to ensure that we're cooling our beer accordingly. Uh, for example, this bottom screen is going to show our ethanol storage graphics. And that tells us how much inventory is currently on site to uh, denature fuel ethanol on the product. You can also tell uh, if the loadout system is engaged, how it's performing as far as the gallons per minute, the difference in pressures. Uh, this is an example of our, our distillation setup in our facility. It shows the different pressures and temperatures that we're currently operating our plants at. It's a water treatment building, so engines are energy for our, for our cooling water. We use the Missouri River bottom water, the Missouri River is about a mile from the north coast of the top. And we have two wells in the river bottom we pump water in two of us. There's plenty of supply, but the quality of water isn't the best. Our river bottom water is high in iron, so our water treatment facility removes the iron content so we can introduce it into our plant. And basically from our DNR discharge permit, our water has to be cleaner as it's exits our facility than what it is coming in. The cooler you see here to the south, that's a yeast cooler. So as technology has progressed in the ethanol industry, several plants such as, such as uh, are using a liquid cream yeast to assist in fermentation. This is the area where we're separating our alcohol from the rest of the unfermentable, unfermentable corn solids and water. The T3 towers are dripping all. This is our sieve feeds. These are our molecular sieve bottles. When we distill.
distill alcohol, we can only distill it up to 190 proof because it forms an azeotrope. And our ship bottles are the piece of equipment that allow us to extract the last 5% of water out of our product. And at that point, it's 199 to 200 proof alcohol. We then pump it through a tank farm and denature it with 2% denature with natural gasoline. At that point, it becomes a final product to be loaded on the truck. Behind the side glass, you can see the vertical tubes of our, uh, of our boiler. So it's approximately 1,500 degrees in this thermal oxidizer. And again, that's what we use to clean up the air before we emit it to the atmosphere. And part of our process, we have waste heat. And instead of losing the energy in that waste heat, we allow that steam to spin a turbine, which is under the insulation blanket. And it spins this generator, which generates electricity. About four years ago, NME purchased a low pressure letdown steam turbine, and we did that to help conserve on the amount of electricity that we use in our process. Uh, so this turbine takes waste heat off our process, spins a turbine which is connected to a generator, and generates approximately 25% of electricity that Missouri Energy uses on, that, on a daily basis. These are our drying drums for our product. We have two of them. Our wet distillers range enters the first one, gets tumble dry, and then gets conveyed up to the second one, which drives to our second drum. And at that point, it's our DDGS. And that gets conveyed dramatically over to our flat storage building. And it means evaporation system. This is a part of the process where we're concentrating our syrup, which is where our protein is found in the process. And through that syrup stream is where we extract our formal. After the system is complete, our syrup at that point is pumped over to our dryers, and while we're drying our feed, we're spraying on syrup, which is how we increase the protein content in our distilled stream. The system here is our cornal extraction facility. You can see the storage tanks behind us. Again, we have approximately 10 days to two weeks from the storage of cornal. DGS, you can see the coarseness of it. But we like to allow our product to uh, cure or cool for approximately 24 hours before we load it into trucks. You can see here in the corner is one of our wheel loaders. And in essence, as this product cures over the course of 24 hours, we'll take it with a loader, push it over in the corner with an underground drag conveyor. And from there, it goes next door into our loadout system where we load it into uh, semi trucks. This product will have about uh, 10 to 12 percent moisture and 27 percent protein. The product is going to be about 20 percent of our revenue for our company. Uh, 
majority of that's going to come from ethanol, but the DDG co-proc is the primary revenue or the large revenue stream for us. And in years such as the, uh, this last year with COVID and different challenges, every dollar counts for us, so uh, we need to depend heavily on our DDG market. This is an additional co-product that our company produces. It's a modified wet distillate product, and it's going to be similar to the dry distillers, except it's going to be higher in moisture. So our dry distillers is going to be a more intended moisture. This is going to be approximately 50 percent moisture. EVB is considered a zero emission facility. So for our facility, the only product or the only uh, items that would leave would be non-contact cooling water that we use for cooling purposes. And then the vapor off our stack, which is water vapor, and then you'll see it in the winter time. A lot of our uh, neighbors call it the cloud maker. Or my kids call it the cloud maker. And also our CO2 stack, there's uh, carbon dioxide that gets vented off that at times. We would have a continuous emissions monitoring system. There's a probe that's uh, placed on the side of the stack, and that's where we monitor the emissions that come off our process 24-7. One, we do it for permitting requirements with the state of Missouri. Also, we do it for environmental stewardship to make sure that the air that we're emitting is uh, well within standards. This is MME's laboratory. This is where we conduct our quality control. And as you can see, Bryce here in the background, he is likely taking a proof sample. So this is a sample of our 200 proof, one of our final products. And he's checking it for quality control. majority of our testing here at MME we do internally. There are a few outside tests that we will send off that are more specialty tests that aren't done with a high amount of frequency. Uh, but the majority of our tests for quality control are done internally amongst our employees. And for example, some of the equipment we have here are centrifuges that we use to spin down different samples that we assess. Chromatograms, we have those gas chromatograms for doing certificate of analysis and we have liquid chromatograms and liquid chromatograms is what we are using to track our fermentation process and these are just different sample sheets that we utilize to to track how well our starch is being converted in our fermenters to ethanol so this will also show any type of bacterial contamination uh, ph temperature this is just a data sheet that we use to monitor uh, quality control for our fermentation this is I see it, an ion chromatograph, and this is a piece of equipment that's part of our certificate of analysis for our final denatured fuel ethanol. So for our final product before it can be shipped via transport truck, we have to certify that the, the moisture content, uh, the acidity, the clarity, the pH are all within spec before we ship that to our final customer. And then here to my right, Lab manager David Stanton is working on water treatment testing. So again, I mentioned earlier that we have to test for iron content and different content in our incoming well water, and this is the testing station that we do that at. This is our main distillery. You can see here one of our shift supervisors today is Joe Eddy, and Joe is working at the helm operating our facility. In the background, you'll see the different computer screens. We have two different operator stations that exhibit the same data. Uh, Joe here is just looking at the one graphic, which is our thermal oxidizer, and he can tell there what the temperatures, pressures, and different operating parameters are currently, uh, as well as he's looking at our cook system and likely will be switching mash trains or doing various tasks that will be throughout the day to operate our facility. You can see in the upper right-hand corner, that's part of our site security system, uh, just to protect our employees to make sure uh, that we keep a monitor on all of our facility grounds. You can see we have cameras both external to monitor traffic coming in and out of our facility as well as internally. So on hot days like today where it's 95 degrees and humid out, we want to keep an eye on our employees who may be working exterior to make sure that uh, Mother Nature doesn't complicate their work schedule. This is the CO2 plant here at Mid-Missouri Energy in Malta Bend. As you'll see to the left, these are the storage tanks. Similar to our facility, the CO2 plant has around 10 days worth of carbon dioxide storage. But in the CO2 process, basically the CO2 gas that comes off our fermentation uh, vessel, the fermentation tanks, uh, we collect that as a gas, it's scrubbed, and then it is blown over to the CO2 facility where they compress it and cool it. So really just a couple simple steps in 
making liquid carbon dioxide. They use an uh, anhydrous ammonia to cool it. And you can see up here on the right the cooling tower that's part of that system. They're doing some maintenance on it uh, today. Uh, but as far as the, the usage of carbon dioxide, uh, the primary markets for the CO2 is going to be as a uh, precursor for dry ice production. So this facility, the owners of this facility, they own and operate two dry ice plants, one in St. Louis, one in Kansas City. And they're going to take this liquid CO2 out of this plant, transport it to those facilities and make dry ice. And the dry ice business has been, I guess, ever growing in recent years for the uh, flash frozen, uh, the quick mail order foods that they send out in the mail, like steaks, uh, items like that. So uh, obviously for CO2, typically the summer months are gonna be the busiest for demand just because uh, the cooling requirements in the summer months. Uh, dry ice is one in use for it. It's also used in, um, in for large like, meat packing facilities for freezing uh, different varieties of meats. Uh, it's also used in water treatment for pH adjustment. It takes around two pounds of liquid CO2 to make one pound of dry ice. Uh, it's kind of the metrics of it. And for us as an ethanol producer, we grind about 50,000 bushels a day of corn, and we're gonna produce around 400 ton a day of carbon dioxide out of our facility. So this facility, the CO2 plant's gonna capture about 50% of that, or 200 ton a day is the capacity for this facility. And the primary pieces of equipment you'll see here are the compressors, this one's labeled C2, this one is C1, but in essence, as the gas comes in, these compressors are pumping up the pressure on the CO2. And then on this other side, we have the ammonia uh, components. And again, these are compressors as well to compress ammonia. But this is the refrigeration part. So again, the, as the CO2 comes in as the gas, we're gonna compress it, cool it, compress it, and cool it. At that point, once it gets under a certain amount of pressure and a, and a threshold temperature, it turns into a liquid liquid product. And then from there, it's pumped out into the storage tanks. Well, they have seven to ten days worth of storage here on site. That is a real life ethanol plant, um, and nothing can substitute for the sights, sounds, and smells in person. But we tried to, to capture that in this video. But with that said, I am happy to have Chris Wilson with us today. So we're gonna be joined by him. Um, he'll be able to answer some questions you have. So again, if you could type your questions in the Q&A box down at the bottom of your screen and Chris will be able to answer any questions you might have. But I'll get us started by asking Chris um, if he could tell us a little about how the ethanol production process has changed over time, such as energy intensity and yield. Yes, good. And I'll speak up so everyone can hear me. Uh, the three metrics we typically assess are yields, number one, and that's measured in gallons per bushel. Uh, the second one is energy usage, which is uh, basically BTUs per gallon of ethanol produced. And then third one's going to be electrical usage, and that's measured in kilowatt hours per gallon. So for example, our company started around 15 years ago, and our yield was approximately 2.7, 2.75 gallons uh, per bushel. And we measure those in undenatured gallons before the denaturant is added. Uh, but today, MME is averaging uh, between 2.9 to 2.95 gallons per bushel. Uh, so there's been quite, a, uh, quite an increase in efficiency for our plant uh, as technology has advanced, as we've made modifications to it, as we've learned to better operate it over time. Um, in regards to the energy use and electrical usage, uh, we've probably seen 15 to 20 percent uh, improvement in those efficiencies over the 15 years we've operated. And if it was if it was understandable in in the, my language there on the tour, uh, we did install a turbine a few years back, and it generates approximately 30 percent of our electrical needs. So we've seen even a, a larger decrease in our electrical usage uh, since we first started in 2005. Thanks, Chris. We do have another question. Can you tell us what some of the new technologies that have been implemented over the past several years are and also what might be coming down the pike? Sure. Um, you know, probably the number one I would reference first would be corn oil extraction. Uh, corn oil extraction is a technology we put in our plant uh, probably five to seven years ago. Majority of the industry uh, has that installed currently. Uh, CO2 recovery is another one that a, a portion of the industry uh, has has implemented in past years, uh, but probably the newer technologies I would reference would be protein concentration. 
uh, just trying to uh, get a higher protein distiller's grains, uh, something that competes more along the lines of a soybean mill. Um, cogeneration is another technology that you see plants looking at. In essence, they would be uh, generating uh, um, enough electricity on site to meet all the needs of the ethanol plant and also uh, potentially producing an excess where they could sell back all, out on the grid to the communities. Um, also, uh, other technologies that facilities are looking at would be uh, integration with renewable diesel production. Uh, one of the co-products, as we mentioned earlier, is corn oil out of, um, out of our ethanol plant, and corn oil can be used uh, both as a precursor um, for, for biodiesel or renewable diesel. So some facilities are looking at the potential to co-locate a renewable diesel technology alongside their ethanol plant just because they have the feedstock readily available. Another question here. What regulatory barriers keep you from being even more efficient or stifle technological development? That comes from one of the congressional staff. Um, well, on a regulatory standpoint, we're regulated by uh, OSHA. For Missouri, the Missouri DNR is the entity that regulates on behalf of the EPA. Um, and I don't know currently that we have many regulatory barriers as far as our production part of it. Uh, obviously, we want to make sure that uh, any emissions coming off our stack is, you know, is uh, in the best stewardship of the environment in our community. Uh, so I don't know that I would say there's regulatory barriers as far as the production currently. Um, I, I think from a facility like us that's more, uh, that is ag-owned, I, I think our concern is more the barriers to farming that's providing the feedstock to us. Uh, and, and the prior speaker, you know, comment on those, but uh, that, that'd be my response there. Thanks, Chris. So I have a couple others here that I'm going to um, read both of them to you and let you answer them. One of them is, what is the purpose of the thermal oxidizer? And also, what does a wet mill do differently? So I'll let you answer both those. Okay, uh, a thermal oxidizer, uh, as it, its name implies, thermal being heat and oxidizer, it, it creates oxidation. Basically, when we dry our, our leftover grain, so everything that was not fermented and turned into ethanol, we dry that. Uh, concentrate our protein and fiber and fat strings up for uh, animal feed. And when we are drying that grain, we are releasing the moisture and the moisture is going to go out our stack and enter the environment. Uh, there are some contaminants that are in that vapor stream. So our thermal oxidizer heats that vapor stream up to the point that any potential harmful uh, components in that are decomposed and rearranged where those molecules are no longer in a harmful state. So that's what our thermal oxidizer does. Um, and then your, the other question, Jessica, I'm sorry. Sure thing. If, what can you tell us? What a what a wet mill? Oh uh, yeah. Oh, yep, sorry. Uh, yeah. So a wet mill. Um, a wet mill typically is going to extract more products uh, for sale than a traditional dry mill. So maybe I start with a dry mill first. A dry mill is basically going to grind the uh, corn kernels that are in a you know a hard corn kernel. If you imagine them coming right off the the corn cob itself at harvest, we're going to run those through a hammer mill, pulverize that into a flour. And then the primary components off a of dry mill are going to be the, the DDGS, uh, the, the ethanol and carbon dioxide. Uh, you know, here in the last 10, 15 years, we've migrated where we've also extracted corn oil. A wet mill takes a little bit different approach. Instead of grinding the corn kernel immediately, uh, they steep it, is my understanding. They steep it in a mild acidic solution and they separate the germ in a different manner than we do, or separate the different components of the corn kernel. And typically the wet mill um, is going to try to isolate different components, more components out of the corn kernel than what a traditional dry mill plant. Uh, an, an example might be, uh, you know, sweeteners or sugars, uh, you know, that, um, that are added to different beverages, you know, such as Coca-Cola or others that would use, uh, you know, different sugar components. That's an example of what a wet mill might produce, but typically they're extracting more products. So in the last five years, you've kind of seen our, industry migrate from a traditional dry mill more in towards the middle to where we are starting to extract more products uh, similar to what a wet mill has done for, for many years. 